Grace and peace be with you from our Lord Jesus Christ, and welcome to this online service of worship of Highland Presbyterian Church. We are thankful that you are worshiping with us this day, whichever day it is. We are thankful, especially if you haven't worshiped with us many times online, we welcome you, and we pray that this will be a meaningful time of worship for you. We have a special welcome to our musician for the day. Beth Martin is sharing her gifts with us. We are thankful for all the ways that we individually bring our gifts and come together as a church family. We invite you to find our website, highlandprez.org. While you're there, you can find a bulletin for use during this worship. You can also find our latest newsletter, Highlights, you can find our button for online giving. You can find a friendship pad. We invite you to sign it and let us know that you worshiped with us and whatever day it is that you're sharing in this service. We invite you to browse around on our website, find out other ways that God is working through this family of Highland. We have many plans on our website for upcoming opportunities for learning and growth, especially as a new season kicks off in the life of this church in September. We are grateful for all the many ways that God is continuing to work among us, bringing us together, sending us out into this world which God so loves. With glad and thankful hearts, let us now turn to God during this time of worship. We come to worship God in our need, bringing with us the needs of the world. We come to God who comes to us in Jesus and who knows by experience what human life is like. We come with our faith and with our doubts, with our hopes and with our fears. We come as we are because it is God who invites us to come. And God has promised never to turn away. Let us worship God. Let us pray. 
Holy God of all creation, maker of the world and everything in it, you are never far from each one of us. We come seeking to be near you. So reveal yourself to us, dwell with us, abide in us. We live because of you. We hope because of you. This we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, in whom we live, and the spirit of truth who abides in us. Amen. it is in God's strength that we endure and it is in God's love that we confess we have been claimed as God's beloved children God invites us as beloved children to come to God with our confession to admit our love and our hate to admit our faith and our fear trusting in god's love and mercy let us join together in our time of confession we will use the printed prayer of confession first followed by a time of silent confession let us pray merciful god in your presence we confess our sin and the sin of this world Although Christ is among us as our peace, we are a people divided against ourselves as we cling to the values of a broken world. The profit and pleasures we pursue lay waste the land and pollute the seas. The fears and jealousies that we harbor set neighbor against neighbor and nation against nation. We abuse your good gifts of imagination and freedom, of intellect and reason, and turn them into bonds of oppression. Lord, have mercy upon us. Heal and forgive us. Set us free to serve you in the world as agents of your reconciling love in Jesus Christ.
Merciful God, we thank you for hearing our prayers. Amen. Friends, hear and believe the good news. Jesus Christ lived and served, died and rose again so that we might be reconciled to God, to one another, to the world, to all of creation. What wonderful good news this is. What wonderful gift of grace God has given us. Friends, believe this good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Good morning, Highland friends, and welcome to this time for young disciples. I'd like to invite the children to come a little closer to their screens. In just a few moments, we're going to be hearing a reading again from the book of Acts. And in this reading, we hear about the Apostle Paul being among the people in Athens. One of the things that Paul noticed right away was that the people had many different gods that they worshipped, and they called them all by different names. Some were made of wood that had been carved into an idol. Some were made of stone. There was even one that said, had an inscription that said, an unknown god. How silly is that? <laughs> so Paul began to tell the people there about the one true God. I want to tell you about God who doesn't live in a stone or a piece of wood that's been carved or even a shrine, but rather this God is with you all the time. So Paul said, put away your idols. Come and hear more about the God of all creation. So now we're going to hear and see a story about others who called God different names, but in the end learned that God is the one God who is always with us. In God's Name by Sandy Eisenberg Sasso Illustrated by Phoebe Stone. After God created the world, all living things on earth were given a name. The plants and the trees, the animals and the fish, and each person, young and old, had a special name. But no one knew the name for God, so each person searched for God's name. The farmer whose skin was dark like the rich brown earth from which all things grew, called God source of life. The girl, whose skin was as golden as the sun that turned the night into day, called God creator of light. The man who tended sheep in the valley called God shepherd. The tired soldier who fought too many wars called God maker of peace. The artist who carved figures from the earth's hard stone called God my rock. Sometimes the people who called God by different names were puzzled. They said, every living thing has a single name. The marigold, pansy, and lily, the oak tree, sequoia and pine. God must have a single name that is greater and more wonderful than all other names. Each person thought his name for God was the greatest. Each person thought her name for God was the very best. The farmer who called God source of life said, this is the true name for God. The girl who called God creator of light insisted, this is the most splendid name for God. The shepherd, the soldier, and the artist believed they had the perfect name for God, but no one listened, least of all God. 
And so each person kept searching for God's name. The woman who cared for the sick called God healer. The slave who was freed from bondage called God redeemer. The grandfather whose hair was white with the years called God ancient one. The grandmother who was bent with age and sorrow called God comforter. The young woman who nursed her newborn son called God mother. The young man who held the hand of his baby daughter called God father. And the child who was lonely called God friend. All the people called God by different names. They tried to tell one another that their name was the best, the only name for God, and that all other names were wrong. But no one listened, least of all God. And so each person kept searching for God's name. Then one day, the person who called God Ancient One and the one who called God friend, and the one who called God mother, and the one who called God father. All the people who called God by a different name came together. They knelt by a lake that was clear and quiet like a mirror, God's mirror. Then each person who had a name for God looked at the others, who had a different name. They looked into God's mirror and saw their own faces and the faces of all the others. And they called out their names for God, source of life, creator of light, shepherd, maker of peace, my rock, healer, redeemer, ancient one, comforter, Mother, father, friend, all at the same time. At that moment, the people knew that all the names for God were good, and no name was better than another. Then all at once, their voices came together, and they called God one. Everyone listened, most of all, God. As we come to share our scriptures this day, let us first come to God in prayer. Let us pray. Holy God, we are your very own, the work of your hands. We pray that your Holy Spirit would move among us as we share these words of scriptures. Open our eyes to your presence and open our ears to your word. Receive the worship of our hearts and minds, and may it be pleasing to you. For it is in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our Old Testament lesson this day is Psalm 148. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his host. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens, and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded, and they were created. He established them forever and ever. He fixed their bounds, which cannot be passed. Praise the Lord from the earth, you sea monsters in all deeps. Fire and hail, snow and frost, stormy wind fulfilling his command. Mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, wild animals and all cattle, creeping things and flying birds. Kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and rulers of the earth. Young men and women alike, old and young together. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His glory is above earth and heaven. He has raised up a horn for his people. Praise for all his faithful, for the people of Israel who are close to him. Praise the Lord. 
This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We come this day to the end of our journey through the Acts of the Apostles, a journey we began back in the Easter season as we were reflecting on ways that the risen Christ was present in the power of the Holy Spirit in the lives and in the life together of that ancient church community. This journey has been helpful for us in our time as we have been thinking anew about what it means to be church in such time as this. So we are grateful for the witness of scripture and providing such help and such guidance for us in our own time. Our reading this day comes to us from the Acts of the Apostles in the 17th chapter, reading verses 16 to 34. Listen now for God's word. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was deeply distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he argued in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and also in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Also, some Epicurean and Stoic philosophers debated with him. Some said, what does this babbler want to say? Others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign divinities. This was because he was telling the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. So they took him and brought him to the Areopagus and asked him, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? It sounds rather strange to us, so we would like to know what it means. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners living there would spend their time in nothing but telling or hearing something new. Then Paul stood in front of the Areopagus and said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he who is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. From one ancestor he made all nations to inhabit the whole earth, and he allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live, so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him, though indeed he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said. For we too are his offspring. Since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of mortals. While God has overlooked the times of human ignorance, now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will have the world judged in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. When they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some scoffed, but others said, we will hear you again about this. At that point, Paul left them, but some of them joined him and became believers including Dionysius the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Don McCulloch, the past president of San Francisco Seminary, told a story of a summer vacation he took in Seattle. He had rented a sailboat for a day and was enjoying a gloriously beautiful day on Lake Union. The breeze was blowing, the boat was scudding along at high speed, and if the kingdom had not yet come, he says, it, it felt very, very near. Suddenly, from out of nowhere, a float plane landed just a few yards in front of him. His heart stopped, his body tensed with shock. He had heard nothing of the plane. The pilot had idled his engine, and the boat's sail had completely blocked his view. To his left, he had seen the skyline of Seattle and the peak of Mount Rainier in the background. To his right, nothing but white Dacron sails stretching out to the sky. 
The sail had completely blinded him. His distorted perspective had given him a false sense of security, a skewed apprehension, he says, of the true state of things. You know, that's, that's what idols do. And like it or not, we all have them. They move front and center in our lives. And they keep us from seeing things the way they really are. They distort our view of the world and of ourselves. Idols, idols everywhere. That's what Paul finds when he goes to Athens. He found a people searching, searching for God, longing for God. But they were finding God in all the wrong places. They had put their trust in lesser things, human intellect, happiness, and so on. Not that those are bad things. They just can't sustain us. I mean, we'd like to think that we know better. You and I have our idols too. Probably not carved out of wood and stone, but idols nevertheless. Idolatry for us might best be understood as the practice of ascribing absolute value to things that are of relative worth. That's what Frederick Beekner suggests. He goes on to say that under certain circumstances, money, patriotism, sexual freedom, moral principles, family loyalty, physical health, social or intellectual preeminence, and so on. All of these things are fine to have around, but to make them the standards by which all other values are measured, to look to them to justify your life and to save your soul is sheerest folly. They just aren't up to it. These days, it's pretty tempting for us to, to want to pick on those whose so-called idols are so obvious to us. I saw this week where a pastor was beating up on those he believes to be socialists, namely those who support vaccinations as a way of protecting lives and bringing an end to this infernal pandemic. He suggests that such folk have traded faith in God for the idol of government. I disagree. Meanwhile, others have noted the idols of white supremacy or of individual freedom that ignores the well-being of neighbors and communities. I'm more inclined to agree with that assessment. But even then, doing so can keep me from seeing my own distorted perspectives or misplaced allegiances. John Calvin was right. Our, our minds are constant factories of idols. In fact, it's one of our chief problems. It's easy for us to give ultimate allegiance to almost anything, especially ourselves, in place of God. But look at, look at what Paul says. I mean, he knows that the people of Athens are doing this. He knows that they are worshiping all of these different idols. But rather than beat them up about the follies of worshiping powerless gods, he instead affirms the fact that they are searching. You are very religious people, he says. You're a seeking people. But I've got news for you. The one you are seeking has actually come and found you. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said that one of the tasks of ministry is to arrange the contingencies for an encounter with the divine. And that's what Paul does here. Paul turns the idolatry of the people of Athens into an opportunity to proclaim the good news. The God that they call unknown is known indeed. There, amidst the idols in Athens, Paul proclaims the presence of the living God. Now, it could have been different. Paul could have pronounced a word of condemnation or a warning that if the Athenians didn't turn to God, then God was going to get them or have nothing to do with them. But God is not fickle that way, waiting for us to get it right before coming to us in love or grace. The good news of the gospel is that the living God comes to us and holds on to us 
despite our idols, whatever they may be, money or love or youthfulness or religion or power or even family. Not to affirm the power of those things over us, but to remind us of a more excellent way and of the possibility of the full, abundant life that we can have when our lives are more rightly arrayed. I think of Don McCulloch's sail blocking his view and how those things to which we might ascribe ultimate worth can keep us from seeing things the way they really are and how that in turn limits our lives. Some give that ultimate worth to money. We all know that money does not necessarily make for full, abundant, or joyful life. Some would give that place to family, but families for all of their goodness and love are bound to disappoint. The same with making an idol out of one's nation. Again, nations can be a great good. But when we are loyal to them above all else, trouble is usually not far behind. In these unsettled days of pandemic, the crisis of the end of the war in Afghanistan begun 20 years ago in response to the terrorist attacks of 9-11, along with storms and fires raging around us. What difference does this make? The living God present among us in the wreckage of these days with our idols strewn about. What difference this living God there in the midst of the misplaced priorities and allegiances and devotions of our lives? I came across a file in my office this week from those post 9-11 days with the reminder of an editorial by Peggy Noonan, in which she responded to a prompt from a friend who asked, how has September 11th changed your life? This was 20 years ago and Noonan responded, I didn't know the answer or rather I knew a bunch of answers, but not one. So I sat and thought and then I knew. I wrote back, let me tell you what 9-11 did to me. It made me hungrier for life. It made me feel more tenderly toward it and more grateful. It's all short. Even in the worst life, it's too short. And you want to really feel and experience it and smell it and touch it and thank God for it. Again, that was nearly 20 years ago, I wonder if she would say the same thing these days. I hope she would. I hope we would. I mean, in these days of incessant stress and struggle, there's a helpful word there. Gratitude. And that's it. Gratitude for the living God right there in the middle of the messiness of our lives. The living God present among us in the risen Christ who reorients us again and again toward love and abundant life. While our idols may block our view, they cannot ultimately keep this living God from getting to us and holding on to us. That may be the best news of all. Amen. Our affirmation of faith is the Apostles' Creed. Let us say together what it is that we believe. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. 
Amen. Let us pray. Holy God, we come together to pray as a people who would like to think that we love you with all our hearts and souls and minds. But there are so many other things in our lives that clamor for our attention that we often relegate you to Sundays and times when we want you to rescue us. For there are so many distractions and false idols who compete for our attention and turn our eyes away from you. Most of us really do want you to be the one in whom we live and move and have our being. We really do want to hear your voice above all the other voices in our lives, but we get bogged down in the daily routine and confusion of the world. We forget who we are. We forget who you are. We forget what this body of the church is supposed to be. So here we are gathered in prayer before you today with all of our human shortcomings in our short attention spans, asking that you would make yourself known to us, that you would help us to recognize the presence of the holy, that you would continue to challenge us, inspire us, and make us into the people you want us to be. In the midst of a divided world, we come before you united in our prayers. We lift up to you our prayers for the people of Afghanistan, for the confusion, fear, and violence of this moment for the Afghan people. May we remember our neighbors and their need, sharing what we can in our gifts of compassion. We pray for the people of Haiti reeling from another week of searching for survivors and scrambling for basic needs in the midst of this earthquake and storm. We lift up our prayers for places in our world where the climate crisis is climbing to new heights, impacting rainfall, raging fires, and endangering land and lives. We lift up our prayers for those entrusted to lead, those making hard decisions, especially in this moment, weighing pandemic spread in our hopes for mutual safety, while we all hope and long to be back together in some way of normal. Our prayers continue to be raised for those facing new diagnosis, transitions into hospice, complications during recovery, and the strain so many suffer with mental illness exacerbated by the stress of this moment. Hear our prayers, O oh God, for you are strong enough to hold them all and make possible what we could never imagine. Encourage us in our ministry of response and care for one another, for all are part of your beloved creation. Hear us now as we join our voices together, praying the prayer your Son, our Lord, taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, the earth is the Lord's and all that is in it. God has given us every good gift and calls us to respond. We have many ways that we give our gifts in response to God's goodness. We give our gifts online, in person, through the mail slot, through the postal system. We have so many ways to share, but we give all of our gifts in return for what God has given to us. Let us with generosity in our hearts and let us with gladness join in prayer. Gracious God, accept what we offer today in the hope that it reflects the offering of our lives, our lives which are dedicated to you and to your service. Bless all that we offer, 
so that together it might serve you in this church and in our world. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Sisters and brothers, as we go forth into the world, the living God goes with us. For this, we go with grateful hearts. And as we go, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with us this day and forevermore. Amen.